So what is this privacy by design paradigm? Why do we need that? Here's the thing. The way our laws operate, they operate after the fact. It's a reactive system that um, some privacy infraction takes place, a data breach, uh, the regulator comes in, we investigate, and then we offer some system of redress after the fact, after the harm has arisen. The problem is that with the enormous growth of the, the web, web 2.0, web 3.0, ubiquitous computing, mobile devices, Wi-Fi everywhere, online social networks, biometrics, tracking, cell phones. I mean, it's impossible to keep abreast of all the infractions, let alone be aware of it. So as I tried to demonstrate in this slide, if I as a regulator see even the tip of the iceberg of all the privacy harms that arise, I'll be lucky. The majority of privacy breaches remain, in my view, unchallenged, unregula unregulated, and largely unknown. And that's the problem. That's the problem that is growing uh, on a daily basis. So increasingly, I've come to believe that it's simply not sufficient to rely on after-the-fact measures such as privacy laws, that we need instead to embed privacy into the design of all that we do. In the next slide, we show that privacy by design was adopted as an international standard in 2010. Once a year, privacy commissioners and data protection authorities from around the world, we gather at a conference, usually in Europe. In 2010, it was in Jerusalem. And we vote on various resolutions in our last closed session. And privacy by design was unanimously passed as an international standard in 2010. So it is now the international framework for protecting privacy around the world. And as you may know, it is reflected in many new legal instruments that have developed since then. In Europe, the uh, draft data protection regulation has privacy by design and privacy as the default featured. In the United States, the Federal Trade Commission has recommended in its three best practices recommended for privacy. The first of those practices recommended is privacy by design. Okay, so what is privacy by design? What is the big deal? At its essence, it is a proactive way of protecting privacy right at the outset. And it is based on one key tenet, which is positive sum, not zero sum paradigms. Let me explain what I mean by that. A positive sum model means that you can have two functionalities, say security and privacy, both increasing in positive increments at the same time. So it's privacy and security, not privacy versus security. Privacy versus security or privacy versus any other functionality reflects a zero sum model. By that I mean you have an increase in privacy, uh, sorry, it's never an increase in privacy, I wish it was, an increase in security, for example, at the expense of privacy, at a decrease of the other functionality, such that the two total the sum of zero. So it's always an increase in one at the expense of another. And in my world, I can tell you, whenever it's a, the other interest is privacy, it's rarely the case that privacy increases at the expense of security or public safety, nor should it. But I also reject the opposite. I do not want other interests being developed at the expense of privacy. So we've developed this, what I call positive sum model, which means basically that you can have an increment positive gain in two functionalities at the same time without one having to suffer at the expense of the other. And I can tell you, I've spoken to many engineers and software designers and computer scientists about the viability of this in actual systems and IT systems and other technologies. And they have always said to me, of course we can do this if you speak to us at the beginning, at the design stage, before the architecture has been set into place. This is eminently doable. Uh, one versus the other, that reflects a world of false dichotomies and unnecessary trade-offs. It's not necessary. So I can assure you 
that this isn't a theoretical construct that I'm asking you to engage in. It's real, and I'm going to demonstrate a number of areas in which it's already operating. So in the next slide, we talk about the seven foundational principles of privacy. This is the essence of what privacy by design is all about. I've, also, I've already mentioned that privacy by design must be proactive, designed at the outset of any new technology or operational process or business practice. Businesses gain enormously by embedding privacy into their uh, operations and business practices because it becomes a win-win. It becomes good for business and good for their customers. It engenders customer loyalty, strengthens their brand, and enhances their reputation. It's a total win. The second principle, privacy as the default setting, is absolutely critical. What it means is privacy is embedded into the system by default, meaning no one has to ask for it. No one has to remember customers or citizens don't have to go and look at the privacy policies and then check off the right box that, yes, they want this feature. No one has time for that in this day and age where everything is virtual and viewed on mobile devices. No one has time for that. No one does that. What I want you to be able to assure the public of is that, yes, privacy is embedded in the system. And you can be assured of that because privacy is the default setting. You don't have to ask for it. It's automatically embedded in the system. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Full functionality, embedded in design, that's the positive sum aspect of it. When you have full functionality, nothing, one interest doesn't suffer at the expense of another. You get everything. End-to-end -end security is absolutely critical to privacy by design. Full life cycle protection from the time of collection to the time of secure destruction is critical. So I always say privacy and security are not one and the same, but you cannot have privacy without strong security. It is absolutely essential. And visibility and transparency, keeping your systems open and your information gathering practices open and transparent to your customers, to your citizens, that's absolutely critical. So they know what you're doing with their information. Remember, it's not your information. It's their information. You have custody and control over that information but it does not belong to you. And finally, respect for user privacy. If you keep your programs and your practices, your operations centered on the user, then all of this flows because you have respect for the user and their privacy. You understand you are using their information. And with that comes a duty of care that can be reflected um, through user-centric practices and user-centric interfaces. In the next slide, this is one of our recent publications called Operationalizing Privacy by Design. And I want to show you this because I want to make sure you realize this is real. Privacy by Design is not a theoretical construct or an academic formulation. No. In my world, it has to work right now on the ground, and that's what we've done. We show in nine different areas how we've operationalized privacy by design. And you should know that in each of these, we have partnered with the giants in the field. We've worked with IBM and Microsoft and Intel and HP and Google and I think I've already said IBM, all of the, the major players so that we show the public that this is not only eminently doable, it's real now. We've showed privacy by design, how it can operate in a variety of different settings, ranging from uh, CCTV, surveillance cameras, to biometrics, working in a very privacy protective manner. We've done multiple papers on smart meters and the smart grid in jurisdictions all around the world. Uh, NFCs, near field communications, RFIDs and various sensor technologies. Uh, we've, we've even done uh, redesigning geolocation data so that geolocation data can be used in terms of um, various advertising that companies want to do, but in a system of using double-blind privacy architecture. It's just brilliant. Take a look at the papers. Remote home health care. Uh, wouldn't it be great if the elderly could remain in their homes longer through the use of so sensors and home health care that would alert uh, medics if they were in need of attention but would allow them basically to operate in their homes. You can do that, and you can do it in a privacy-protective way. Yes, yes, you can. So take a look at the papers. And big data, of course, data analytics. Uh, that all appears to be the rage these days. Well, what do you do for big data? You do big privacy. 
and radical control. That's what you have to do. You can do it all. But the key is to de-identify personally identifiable data before it's used in the data analytics required for big data. And we have multiple uh, avenues that show how that's working. I've done a number of recent um, operations with Deloitte. Uh, you know, Deloitte is one of the leading uh, consulting companies around the world. And Deloitte has these amazing, uh, what they call hives, uh, highly immersive visual environments where they do big data analytics uh, in real time. But they've gone to great lengths to assure their customers and their clients that they do not use personally identifiable data. The data are scrubbed before they're submitted to the data analytics, rendering big data eminently doable and privacy strongly protected. This is what positive sum paradigms are all about. Multiple functionalities at the same time. You can do this. Now in the next, next slide, I just want to show you a couple of things we've done. Uh, privacy by design applied to biometrics. We've developed something called biometric encryption, which is the strongest form of using a biometric, be it a fingerprint, a retinal scan, uh, a facial imaging, whatever you want, hand geometry, but doing it in a totally privacy protective way so that the biometric is only used for the intended purpose and no secondary use is permitted. It's a win-win proposition, and it's up and running. We're using it here in Ontario in our casinos. Uh, and take a look at our website. Uh, we'll, we'll explain how that's done. I'd love to tell you about how we do it, but then that would take me another half hour, so we don't have enough time for that. In our next slide, we, do, we have a paper that we did with, um, we work with academic function, uh, institutions all the time in the United States, Arizona State University partnered with us to do a paper on mobile communications and how you can have mobile devices and apps, etc., and do this in a privacy protective way. So we outline how you can do that and how device manufacturers, um, network providers, uh, operating systems, they can all develop various systems to ensure that privacy is embedded. We've also worked with Microsoft. In the next slide, we talk about Wi-Fi positioning set systems and how you always have to be aware of unintended consequences, what you hadn't anticipated. And we talk about that, how you can address that. In the next slide, I talk about smart meters and smart grid. I told you we'd done a lot of work on this, so we've done seven papers. Many of the papers are in our jurisdiction here in Canada, but we've also partnered with jurisdictions in, in Europe and Germany and in the United States and with San Diego Gas and Electric. So we work with actual uh, companies who are developing uh, these systems and delivering them. So we've worked with all of the, uh, the electrical utilities named in these papers have partnered with us to assure their customers that they're using smart meters, but that those smart meters are not affecting their privacy whatsoever, that their privacy remains protected, and they get the benefits in terms of um, green conservation efforts, et cetera, uh, multiple wins, multiple gains. In our next slide, we've done two papers on home health care, how you can use remote devices and sensors in the home to uh, protect individuals, patients, enable the elderly to stay in their homes longer, all of this without jeopardizing their health care whatsoever. So take a look at those papers. And then in our next slide, this is the paper I was referring to earlier, Bearing Media is an amazing uh, new startup. Uh, it's not new anymore. I guess it's been up and running about three, four years now. But they've developed this system using a, a double-blind privacy architecture where companies can indicate um, what uh, advertising they would like sent to which demographic in society, which geographical locations. And Bearing Media, this company, can in fact deliver that without anyone knowing who gets what. So no one knows the identity of who's getting uh, what type of advertising, and yet the desired goal is met. It's a real win-win, uh, so please take a look at it, and you'll see the ingenious um, technology that they developed for this. So I will now go to my last slide and ask you to lead with privacy by design, get rid of that dated zero-sum thinking, and substitute a positive sum doubly enabling win-win solution uh, to, take, to take its place. 
You don't need to trade off one interest in favor of another. We've demonstrated in multiple ways that you can have several solutions operating at the same time and um, this leads to much greater gains and functionality. And if you don't embed privacy as a core functionality, uh, I want to just remind you that what you may end up getting is what one of my colleagues in Germany, Kai Rannenberg, calls privacy by disaster. And that's the last thing you want. So get rid of that, embrace privacy by design, and work with us to develop, to develop a better world by allowing privacy and other functionalities to take place. And if you need any assistance, you can email my office. We always respond. We're here to help you. Thank you very much for your time.